Lynn Sosnowski now, who's um, assistant professor in, in horticulture and focuses on research and extension surrounding sustainable weed management. So I think Lynn, can you start to share your screen? I think you could, you can even boot Harold off. Awesome, and we're excited to have Lynn talk about some of her herbicide resistant work and um, she's done a lot of work, at least she did a lot of work at UC Davis where she looked at the interaction between um, tillage and, and weed management. So with that, take it away. Okay, thanks. Um, actually, I'm not, at, not at UC Davis with tillage because I worked in, in almond production environments and, and walnuts and uh, we, we don't do a lot of uh, disturbance in them, but um, I, ha I have done some work with, with, with tillage and other environments, but what I do really want to talk about is uh, resistance, but I also want to talk about some novel technology that we're starting to work on, which is electrical weed control. Um, and we want to talk about that because electrical weed control is, is being touted for multiple benefits. One, as a, a strategy to manage our ever increasing resistance problem, uh, but to manage this problem without needing to rely on soil disturbance events and therefore preserve soil structure and soil health. So um, let's start off with the problems with weeds. Uh, they are direct competitors for our crops that result in yield loss, uh, you know, first and foremost, and, and, and our, our really number one strategy for, or, or reason for managing them. But there's a lot of other impacts that weeds have on our production environments. Uh, they can reduce harvest efficiency by um, impacting the ability of equipment to move through the field. And an example would be Palmer amaranth. And this is what this picture is, uh, on this slide is of, this is Josh Putman. He's a cooperative extension specialist. Uh, this is a cornfield in Steuben County, and this is Palmer amaranth infestation in that field. Uh, weeds can directly parasitize crops, so daughter in alfalfa systems, mistletoe in, in various tree species, broom rape is a big problem uh, in Israel, parts of the Middle East, Mediterranean, now in California in processing tomatoes. They can be hosts for pests and pathogens of crops. Um, anyone who's paying attention to the spot, spotted lanternfly, um, a situation that's developing, a tree of heaven, an invasive tree species is a preferred host for a spotted lanternfly. They can be toxic or dangerous in their own right. Uh, and they can affect ecosystem services, uh, such as Medusa head out west disrupting fire cycles, or just be, uh, aesthetically displeasing if you go to the south and see kudzu uh, covering, um, you know, trees and, and other, you know, other, other plants uh, in, in those environments. So if we want to look again, we talked about uh, direct yield losses being really uh, substantial and, and important for growers and, and a, a driving factor for managing weeds. Um, there's some work that's been done by the Weed Science Society of America and their crop yield loss committee that's trying to quantify this. And, and what they've done is they've gone in and they've looked at a lot published data and they've just, they've compared where we've had effective, you know, weed controlling treatments versus uh, our non-treated checks that have maybe had uh, other best management practices with respect to crop development, so irrigation, fertilizer, et cetera, but just didn't have the weed control. And then calculated what those yield losses would look like if we didn't have weed management. And this is both chemical and non-chemical. Uh, and then put a dollar numbers to this. They found out it's significant. And so we're looking at anything in, in our major crops uh, from 50% yield loss to 70% yield loss at anywhere from uh, hundreds of million dollars per year to billions of dollars per year if we don't do anything to manage weeds. Uh, this is another one, this was uh, in dry beans. Again, you know, 71% yield loss if we don't take any weed management efforts, which could equate to $722 million. 
So we've done field crops to date, but right now that yield loss committee is putting together the potential yield loss estimates for US vegetable crops. So to manage weeds, um, herbicides for, for many systems are a critical component of their control programs. And we use a lot of herbicides in the United States um, for the management of unwanted ve vegetation. So this is US EPA data, and this is, uh, I think, from 2012. Uh, and what they found is compared to all the other pesticides that we're putting out, if we look at our, our, our pesticide use across crops, herbicides are our number one pesticide that we're, we're putting down. And, and the US ag sector, significantly, where 89% of all herbicide use was in the ag sector. And this translates to significant costs for growers. So again, we're putting a lot of herbicides down. We're also paying a lot of money um, for um, to put those herbicides down. And again, significantly in the ag sector. So this is 2012 data, but if we look at uh, some, some data from the Economic Research Service over time, you know, it, it's pretty consistent. We've been, we've been using a lot of herbicides. This is, this is percent of planted acres that we've been applying herbicides for, for corn. Uh, this is for, for soybean. And, and this is for cotton. And we're looking at anywhere from 1952 to 1958. So, so herbicides have been a really important part of our weed management practices um, consistent, consistently uh, across decades. Uh, and, and some of this has helped to facilitate um, the adoption of reduced tillage systems. Not, not completely. We were... Um, you know, there are, there are other driving factors and there's a lot of people who want to say, well, Roundup Ready systems, that's the reason, you know, we, we, we see a lot of reduced tillage. No, we, in a lot, in our cropping systems, we had other, other drivers. Cotton might be one where, where Roundup Ready systems actually did assist in the adoption of reduced tillage in that environment because we, we do have so few herbicides for cotton. Um, They've helped, uh, but again, not, not, not sold drivers. And for, for more recent data, just, just to show you that this, this use of herbicides uh, in our major production environments continues. This is 2014, 2017, and 2018 data. Um, and showing, again, that kind of dominance of, of herbicides and if, if we actually look um, most recently, glyphosate being the most significant player, uh, particularly in these production environments. Now, herbicides are not always completely effective and there's a lot of reasons why they're not. Um, we're choosing the wrong herbicide for the wrong species. Uh, we're not putting out the correct rate. We're not using the right spray volume. Uh, we're not using the proper spray additives, such as a surfactant that might be recommended on the label. There can be antagonism uh, between herbicides, but also between herbicides and in, insecticides or fungicides. There can be antagonism between pesticide classes. Uh, there are other uh, spray solution issues, hard water, water with a lot of organic matter in it, having an incorrect pH, weeds that are just too large to be controlled with herbicides, plant stress that can uh, reduce the efficacy of, of herbicides because uh, particularly systemic herbicides that need to be translocated or that are active on bio, uh, you know, translocated and then very active on certain biochemical processes that shut down under stress conditions, environmental factors, and then herbicide resistance, which is what I wanna talk about because it's kind of driving a uh, part of our decision to be looking at electrical weed control. So herbicide resistance from the Weed Science Society of America is defined as an ability of a plant to survive and reproduce following a dose of a herbicide that's normally lethal to the wild type. And this kind of translates into, we used to be able to, to kill this plant with this herbicide and now we can't. And this is different from tolerance, um, which is we've just never been able to control this weed with this herbicide. And we do have a lot of, of plant species out there that are just naturally tolerant to the chemistries uh, we put down. So 
uh, understand that there there are you know this is in there is inherent um, insensitivity to to products, but we do have these dramatic changes, these dramatic shifts, genetic shifts um, that that alter a status of certain populations. Uh, with repeated use of a chemical product. And I like to use this slide um, because it's, it, it talks about evolution and we have to understand this is an evolution, evolutionary process, okay? Um, this isn't, we don't mutate the plants by putting the herbicide on them and we, we apply the herbicide, now they're resistant. The resistance mechanisms are already there in the population. We just drive um, population shifts to, to be, uh, to a more tolerant state through our repeated use of, of our herbicide. So if A and B are, are both in the field, same species, but one has a genetic mutation that uh, confers resistance uh, and one doesn't, we kill off the one that doesn't, A continues to grow, sets seed, and over time, again, we drive that population towards resistance. And I, I do want to point out resistance is out there, okay? before the herbicides get put down. And this is probably the most dramatic example of resistance is uh, a, a, a team out of France went and they collected uh, DNA from 734 dried specimens of black grass. And these specimens were collected between 1788 and 1975. Uh, and, and what they found is that there was a, a specimen collected in 1888 that contained a genetic mutation that we know now can confer resistance to um, the ACCase inhibiting herbicides in grass species. Okay, that's a hundred years before this herbicide, you know, this class of herbicides was commercialized. So again, resistance genes are already present in weed populations. The repeated use of herbicides um, or herbicide sites of action uh, imparts a selection pressure, and that's where we shift from susceptible to resistant. And if you're curious about the current state of resistance worldwide, uh, it's, it's significant. We have 521 um, unique cases of herbicide resistance, 263 species of our 26 known sites of action. We've got resistance to 23 of them somewhere in the world, 164 herbicides, 71 countries and the United States leads the way with 165 unique cases of herbicide resistance. If we look at the products that we're developing resistance to, uh, these are herbicide classes, uh, the, the ALS inhibiting herbicides, the photosystem two inhibiting herbicides, followed by glyphosate, that's EPSPS, followed by our grass herbicides. Now it's important to note that um, you know, in a good example of selection pressure, some of these classes like the photosystem two inhibiting herbicides and the ALS inhibiting herbicides, um, they can have many active ingredients in them that are, have been commercialized for a long time that are used on a lot of crops uh, and a, a lot of cropping acres. Okay, so a numbers game where, you know, we've, we've put these herbicides down over a wide area and space and time and, and have seen resistance develop as a consequence. We often think about our resistance developing in our agronomic cropping systems, such as corn and cotton and soy, rice, wheat and barley, uh, but our specialty crops aren't, aren't immune. Uh, and we do develop resistance in those systems and a lot of resistances though that even develop in agronomic systems uh, can impact other systems if we have, if those systems have shared herbicides or herbicide classes. Uh, so rotating maybe from, you know, a, a one agronomic production environment to a vegetable you know, production system might not gain uh, you any management effect if you're using similar products and you're not engaging in other uh, weed control strategies. The majority of our resistant weeds are annuals or biennials, but that doesn't mean we don't have resistance in, in our uh, perennial, perennial weeds. We can indeed shift their, their tolerance and their response to, to herb, their responses to herbicides over time. Um, and if you're wondering the classes where we're seeing our grasses and our asters, these are very big plant families. And as a consequence, again, 
with the herbicides. They see a lot of herbicide applications against them. It's a numbers game. We see resistance developing in those, uh, those groups. So the evolution of herbicide resistance does impact grower practices, and that isn't going to include soil disturbance events. Um, there was a big study that was done. Uh, it's called the Benchmark Study. I think they published six papers. It was a, a host of weed scientists uh, across uh, multiple states. I think it was published out of Purdue University, though. You know, looking at changes in, in herbicide use, at changes in hand weeding, at changes in, in cultivation and tillage in response to glyphosate-resistant weeds. Stanley Culpepper in Georgia and I did, did our own. Uh, and where just to, to focus on a, a soil disturbance, we found that you know the, the development of glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth in our cotton systems in Georgia, it incre uh, we saw increased use of mechanical in crop cultivation events, tillage for the incorporation of our pre-plant herbicides. And then growers even started turning to deep turning, mold bore plowing, where we would invert the soil profile um, to, to basically take our, our, we had a really high surface seed bank and invert that soil profile and basically bury those weed seed, you know, uh, 11 inches deep. So we could basically reset the clock and start over. Uh, there was some, some work, Ben Dines et al. from uh, 2018. Uh, again, are, are glyphosate resistant weeds a threat to conservation in agriculture? And this is probably going to be very dependent on uh, the species that you're dealing with, that they found maybe the first two species that come in, you know, have a little less effect on tillage practices. But as you accumulate resistant species, you see a fall in, in, in conservation tillage practices. Um, over time, and so uh, kind of like a, a, a reversion to, to conventional uh, tillage. And, and this is just some of the, 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 the figures that they presented in this paper showing changes in conventional tillage attributed to glyphosate resistant weed development over time. Now, if you're wondering where we are in New York, we haven't actually had a lot of herbicide resistance work that's been done in the state to characterize what our current situation is. Uh, this was all done by Russ Hahn, uh, who, who is retired now. And we know that this does not adequately describe our current situation uh, because we know horseweed in the state of New York, we water hemp, pal amaranth, we have Palmer amaranth here in New York, we know that, that these weeds are resistant. We're just, we're in the current, currently in the process of confirming it. Um, horseweed, if you're dealing with uh, soybean production environments, this is really perhaps uh, one of the most significant threats to, to soybean production. And I, I'm also going to say water hemp in the state of New York, it's a bit more limited right now in its distribution across counties, but um, spring to early summer, late flowering or late summer emerging uh, species. It, it starts off as a rosette. It starts to bolt in the late spring, early summer, produces a lot of wind dispersed seed and it's got multiple resistances um, in, in various populations. So glyphosate, the ALS inhibiting herbicides, uh, photosystem one, that's paraquat, photosystem two, things like atrazine, diuron. We know that we have resistance and we know in these populations, we have accumulation of resistances. So they're not just necessarily resistant to one herbicide mode of action. They can be resistant to maybe two, possibly three herbicide modes of action. So we're doing screening right now uh, with our horseweed uh, efforts. Uh, we've got 30 populations in 2020. We're going to increase that in 2021. Right now, we're screening them for glyphosate resistance, and we're screening them for resistance to our ALS inhibiting herbicides. Um, there are multiple ALS inhibiting herbicides we're evaluating. We've got one done right now, chlorancelum, and just kind of want to suggest that the situation is, is a little bleak. So higher bars mean that these populations were sensitive to the herbicides that we screened against. 
Okay, so out of 30 populations, there's um, three red bars. So there's three populations that didn't have any survivors for field rates of, of Roundup that were applied. And with our chloranzolam, this is an ALS inhibiting herbicide, there were two populations that didn't have any survivors. So all of those other populations are displaying some degree of putative resistance to both of these herbicides. And both of these herbicides are important tools uh, in our, our soybean production environments. Um, the majority of these populations came from soybean systems. Uh, we are screening for paraquat resistance in New York in our, in our, uh, our perennial cropping system. So this is potentially a, a new threat uh, to, to um, our, our, our tree and vine systems that we're, we're watching. Said we're, we're interested in pigweed species and you know pigweed species are some of the most common and troublesome weeds in North America by crop. Uh, a survey of university extension personnel. Um, this is a Weed Science Society of, of America survey that they do. And, and what we're finding is that pigweed species are rising to the top and it doesn't matter if we're talking corn or alfalfa or cotton or soybean or sugar beets or our cold crops, cucurbits, fruiting vegetables. These are some of our dominant weeds and we have these dominant weeds in New York. And so we are going to be screening our red root pigweed, our smooth pigweed, and our pal amaranth. These are the next two that I'm, I'm, I'm worried about. Um, they're much more limited in their distribution, but I, to me, they are much more worse in the damages that they can cause to our production systems. Uh, there's water hemp on the right. It's in, I think, 12 counties in New York. And Palmer amaranth on the left, it's in three counties uh, in New York. But this is the one I'm really, really concerned about. It's big. It is big and it can produce up to a million seeds per plant. And we don't want this getting established because as it gets established, and if we think it has multiple resistances, um, we are very limited in what we can do to, to manage this cost effectively and environmentally. Okay, so it's a very large, by the way, that rightmost picture, that's Palmer amaranth in um, an almond orchard in California. Again, it gets big, but it also gets wide, all right? This is a female Palmer amaranth plant. And this is my hand, and this isn't even the main stem of Palmer amaranth, this is just a branch. Now, granted, it's growing by itself in an area where there isn't competition, but still, this, this is a, a significant problem, and we don't want this problem to get even more established here in New York because we have suspected resistance in New York. Uh, this is a Palmer amaranth on the right um, you, uh, in a field in Steuben County. You can see some dead Palmer amaranth in this field. They're the burned down plants. Uh, but this Palmer amaranth on the right survived three different herbicide modes of action. Okay, it was glyphosate, an ALS inhibiting uh, herbicide, and an auxin herbicide. So that's really one of the last things is to have a multiple resistant population uh, become established and spread. And it, they do spread. They spread on, on, on field equipment. That's probably how we got it here in New York. Um, uh, what, we, what we did is uh, we know the seed are very small. It can hitch ride on grease. It can hitch ride on dirt. It can hitch ride on, on uh, you know, chaff. Uh, that, that isn't cleaned out properly. Again, we had talked, we can shift perennial populations. Uh, this is a perennial sow thistle that uh, we're working with, uh, Christy Hopeting. Um, it uh, appears to be more tolerant of clopyrrolid than other sensitive populations that are nearby. And this is through repeated use of this herbicide. So just so you know, we are doing resistance screening uh, we are looking at horseweed. We are very focused on the amaranth. We're starting palmer amaranth and water hemp evaluations in the greenhouse right now. Uh, we're looking at common lambs quarters um, for, for bentazon, an important herbicide that's used uh, in our, our, our snap bean, dry bean systems. So we can't rely on new herbicides for weed control. And there's a lot of growers that don't want to hear me say this. 
I'm not saying not to use herbicides, but uh, we have to use them more effectively to preserve their efficacy in the long term, uh, because the number of patents for herbicides is dropping off. All right, we've had a, a consolidation of chemical companies. There are fewer companies out there. It's a very expensive process to bring a new herbicide online. It takes a decade and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, it's, it's expensive. And, uh, you know, we have seen a bit of a return in, in breeding efforts to uh, making our, our crop species tolerant to older herbicide products that are already available. Think, uh, you know, our new dicamba in and 2,4-D resistant um, varieties. So herbicides can still be important tools, but we, we, we've got to get out of the mindset that they are our only tool. So we need to expand the toolbox, and this is where I want to get to the electrical weeding, uh, because this is a new project that we're engaging in to look at uh, a novel strategy for managing herbicide resistant weeds and other difficult to control weed species, and also weed species in organic production environments. So if you're wondering about electrical weed control, it's just what it says it is. It controls weeds by applying an electric current directly to unwanted vegetation. Um, and the flow of the electricity through the plant generates heat and that causes the water in the cells to vaporize, tissues to burst and die. Its benefits are touted that there's no disturbance to the soil surface, okay? Uh, no chemical application. So, you know, that this is, this is a valuable tool for managing weeds um, and preserving soil health. It's not an old tech, it's an old technology. Uh, we're thinking about it as new because there's a lot of people reinvestigating it now, but the first patents were actually issued in the 1890s and were actively explored in sugar beets in the 1980s. And again, there's renewed interest in this because of herbicide resistant weeds and in sit situations where we don't have a lot of herbicides already, but we're relying on hand weeding, labor costs are going up. We have an aging labor market in the agricultural environment. And so this is a tool. Um, so we, we partnered with a couple grower cooperators who have what's called, it's called the weed zapper. That's, that's its name. It's a tractor towed PTO driven unit that produces over 100,000 watts of electricity, charges a front mounted bar. That front mounted bar is about uh, 30 feet long and weeds above the canopy that come into contact with the bar are electrocuted. Just to let you know, if you're wondering, well, is there any way to do electrical weeding between rows while weeds are much smaller instead of when they're above the canopy? There are, there, is, there are companies in Europe that are investigating that technology. It is just not in North America yet. Although we're trying to get some of that technology to, to come here and we've been talking with them. COVID has um, upset things a bit. So we started some observational studies uh, to, to look at uh, the impacts of electrical weeding uh, on individual weed species, but then also on fields as a whole. So what, you know, what's changing uh, in soybean fields? How are the crop vigor and the weed vigor changing? And, um, you know, uh, how is the cover changing? Are we, you know, increasing, you know, reducing weed density and cover and therefore giving the crop more area to grow? Um, we also intended to have some soil health measurements, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, as soon as we started COVID, a uh, uh, granting agency told us we needed to pause all of our work. So we didn't get a lot of that data, but we are cleared to restart. Um, but just to, to show you is that, well, hey, we did, we did get um, one or two passes in the fields before they, they sort of shut us down um, as those weeds were starting to emerge. And what we did get is individual species biomass data. Uh, and just, just to show you, this is actually an effective tool. It can reduce the leaf and stem tissue biomass per plant, and it can reduce uh, the reproductive output of these plants. You know, we collected plants that, you know, collected biomass before they were treated and then they ran it through the field and then seven days after we went and those plants, you know, were, were shriveled, they were dead, they were burnt, you know, burnt, I say burned up, it doesn't, doesn't actually burn though. Um, and, and we were able to, to really significantly control the weeds. Um, 
it's you, it's it's a it's not a once and done strategy. The grower in this field started off and then stopped, and and then you know we went back to foxtail, you know, heaven pretty pretty much by September when he wanted to to manage. We also looked at it in table beets, and and this is where I want to kind of get to starting to get to the soil environment and how the soil environment can influence performance, and then what this might be also doing to the soil environment. So uh, one of our growers also grows table beets and uh, he was hand weeding in the summer, but it got too expensive. Uh, the weeds were out of hand. So he wanted to go through and could he use the electrical weeder in, in his table beets? Because don't forget this was originally developed the technology uh, for sugar beets uh, and, and went in and, and went in and electrocuted uh, the, the weeds in his beet system and what we saw kind of in our soybeans is sort of what we saw in, in our beets. We saw a reduction in the biomass of those weed species. So those weeds that came into contact with that bar, you know, we and had that electricity move through it. Yeah, you know what? We did a very, very, very good job at controlling those weeds. The problem was, is we also did a bit of a good control, a job controlling um, the crop. Uh, and the first time that they went through, what you saw is that on six inches on either side of the weeds. Now, granted, the bar, if you if you look at have looked at the previous pictures, those weeds were well above the crop canopy. The bar didn't touch the beets at all. It just touched the weeds, but we had beet death. On, on six inches of either side of these treated weeds. And so what was the catch? And, and this is a soil environment, you know, comes into play. The soil was super dry at the time that we used this technology, um, the first go around, and um, that meant the electricity had to take a path of least resistance after it passed through the weeds. And that meant it went through the beet roots, okay? Because the soil was dry. Um, and, and what we saw is we, we basically destroyed the tap roots uh, of those of the beets that were adjacent to the treated weeds. Uh, and, and just, you know, um, that first pass just really, really, we, we just killed them. There was a later pass, there was greater soil moisture. They changed the setting on, on the unit so they weren't having um, as much elect electrical current. And we saw great, much more reduced injury to the beets. But, you know, there, there are implications on this is uh, the surviving beets had damage to their tap roots. And while some did regenerate, this really affected beet sizing up. And uh, that infected overall yield quantity and quality in the field. So we're still in discussion with the grower about whether we're gonna try this in beets this year in his field, but we are gonna be planting various crops here at Geneva and evaluating an electrical weeder in say snap beans, in bees, in cabbage systems here. And we're gonna be manipulating factors. And one of those factors is gonna be the soil moisture uh, environment um, to look at its impacts on the weed control, but also crop injury potential. So we are doing this. And obviously a lot of what we're focused on is on you know, the crops and, and the weeds themselves, what type of weeds are going to respond, how they're going to respond, you know, again, crops, how are crops uh, going to, you know, facilitate the use of this technology, how are soil conditions going to affect the performance, so again, soil moisture is going to be um, uh, an important component. But we also have some interest in soil health consequences. And this is because a lot of growers are asking us, uh, a lot of organic growers in particular, who are interested in this technology because um, they might be relying on hand labor, particularly in specialty crop systems, to remove their weeds. Think about those beets. That was an organic farm, okay? The hand labor was expensive. So yeah. Okay, what is it going to do to the weeds? What is it going to do to the crop? But what is it going to do to that soil microbial community? You know, is, is I'm, if I'm working on, you know, building a healthy soil environment, is this electrical weeding uh, going to have um, deleterious consequences on, on 
this microbial system and you know what is going to be the micro resiliency in 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 response to electrical weeding and and this is a great question um because we don't know this is an old technology but a new technology and this hasn't been investigated to this date and so this is kind of you know like a you know this is like a million dollar question you know what is it going to do Again, we don't have data. So we know that our other strategies that we're using for weed control, um, particularly herbicides and, and, and tillage and, and other disturbance practices are changing the soil microbiome. Every, every activity we're putting out in the field do, is doing something. So um, I took some, this is from a, a, a great talk that I just gave, but the vineyard microbiome, uh, we, we know that it's a function of many factors, you know, and, and the agronomic microbiomes are going to be a function of factors that are, occur, you know, occurring in the place. Some of that's just going to be where you're located. So, you know, who you start off with is going to be very dependent on your soil type, your geography, where you're located. Um, but it's also going to be a function of what, what you're doing in that environment. So the crops that you plant the herbicides that you apply, the cultivation events that occur uh, are also going to affect microbial communities. Uh, and, you know, these, these changes in microbial communities, so what we're doing, you know, the, the, the activities that we engage in can change microbial communities, but those microbial communities can then have impacts on um, weed control. We uh, in those systems and and we dominance in those systems. So there's there's work that's being done out of Laurie Drinkwater's lab, Jenny Galniffin's lab, showing that agricultural practices have legacy effects on soil microbiomes, and that those microbiomes and those legacy effects can affect crop weed competition. We know that microbial communities, okay, we know that, um, yes, we can apply herbicides and we can shift microbial communities, but those microbial communities can then uh, actually affect the performance of those very herbicides um, that, that cause the ch changes. And, and this is um, um, a concern with atrazine. We know that applications of atrazine, you know, actually sh shift the microbial community to uh, a community that can enhance the degradation of atrazine. And this can happen very quickly, you know, one or two applications, and we can make shifts uh, in th these, um, these soil communities. Okay, so, but, but what about electrical weeding? What about thermal energy? You know, we don't have those definitive answers yet. Um, a lot of us are starting this work, and a lot of us are, this is what we're going to be doing this summer. Um, there is work that's looking at the impacts of microwave technology, probably, which is pretty much pretty closest to what we're getting that have shown, yes, there are community responses um, to, to microwave uh, uh, technology, you know, uh, particularly when, when the heating intensities were, were higher versus lower, um, definitely shifting the, the richness of those communities. And, and, and some of those communities, particularly at those higher temperatures, maybe didn't um, uh, revert back um, to, to a previous state. So there can be some you know, more dramatic um, you know, shifts and, and there's less resiliency in the, the community. So there is work going on out there. It is important to note that these microwave studies are really looking at the direct impacts of the technology on the soil itself, whereas our electrical weeding efforts are going to be indirect. You know, we're looking at the current as it is applied to the weed, you know, and then uh, dissipates in the soil. So we are going to be investigating this in our, our studies this coming season in 2021. And um, I, I've been speaking with Thomas Bjorkman, with Jenny Gowneff and with Kyle Wickings. Uh, to, to put in grants to actually uh, sort of complement where we're more focused on the weeds, but more of a focus on, all right, let's, let's look at the, the soil impacts uh, in more detail than, than just some very coarse, you know, estimates of microbial activity. So wanted to get across that weeds are, th are a threat to our production and our, our weed control practices vary among crops. 
and our herbicides are playing a significant role and that's leading to the development of resistance. In turn, the resistance is, is leading to strategies, you know, um, a, a revision of our strategy or weed management strategies um, to either prevent it or mitigate it once it's established. And that does include soil disturbance practices. So pre-plant tillage, incorporated herbicides in crop cultivation. Uh, it does include the application of different herbicide classes. Uh, it does include, uh, you know, uh, looking at, at cover cropping systems, you know, so it, it's, it's more than that, but, but direct soil disturbance events is certainly a component of it. Just so you know, herbicides aren't the only practices that we develop resistance to. Anything we do really can shift our weed communities that are our species that are tolerant of agronomic practices. We focus on herbicide resistance, but understand um, hand weeding. Uh, we did this in hand weeded rice. We basically um, shifted to, to a weed that mimics rice and now you can't tell it apart and, and, and becomes dominant. Um, mowing, if we go and mow, we, we shift for low growing, spreading or deep rooted perennials in our mowing systems. Even if we um, adopt reduced tillage environments, we find that you know, our weed species shift to small seeded wind dispersed species that can blow in, they tend to accumulate. And, and oftentimes we tend to have higher numbers of weeds in these reduced tillage environments, which then is gonna potentially necessitate depending on our system of reliance on herbicides for control. We're investigating electrical weeders for the management of herbicide resistant and other difficult to control species. Right now, our work has been done in organic systems, but we, we want to expand this to, to, to specialty crops. We also want to expand this to actually go and look at our herbicide resistant horseweed, pigweeds, um, you know, lambs quarters. Um, so, even though, again, these electrical weeders are touted as, you know, as being, you know, friendly and good for soil health, you know, we, we're, we're, we're investigating what the impacts on the soil microbiomes uh, can look like. We meant to do some of this in 2020, we got shut down, uh, but 2021, we're going to resume. So we're really hoping to have a lot more data uh, next year. So I realize this is a heavy on, on the plant side, um, but hope uh, shown you, you know, kind of what's, what's going on in our weed world and, you know, uh, this, this strategy that's coming online and what we're hoping, uh, you know, wh what we're hoping to do more of with respect to, to, to soil health. Uh, Matt Ryan at Cornell in Soil and Crop Sciences, he, I believe he's also going to be doing some work. He's been doing a lot of work with cover cropping um, for um, soybean production systems. I believe he's also going to be continuing that work also with an electric weeder. So I'm going to expect out of Cornell, we're going to see a lot more of this technology uh, in the future. And, and thanks, thanks much for your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Lynn. And great to have that important intersection um, between cover cropping, reduced tillage, and, and the rise of herbicide resistant weeds. Um, so we had a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, do you wanna read them or I can read them for you? How do you, um, you might have to read them because for some reason, uh, my screen has gone black and I can actually not see. The Go. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, so we had one question from Jacob Fox. To what extent is weed seed growth related to bacterial dominated soils and could a focus on improving fungal um, balance or fungal to bacterial ratio do a better job at preventing weeds rather than being reactive afterwards with herbicides and tillage? So that's actually that that's the that work by Laurie Drinkwater and Jenny Gow Nippen. That's that's what they they are getting at. So I, I can't um a lot of it's a lot of it's still very preliminary. So I, I I'm not I'm not gonna be able to give a, a good good response to that because I don't think we know the whole picture yet. Um but this is a big area right now, I'm gonna tell you, of interest in the weed science society, where there's a lot of people who are now investing in answering this 
question, including my myself with with Kyle Wickings and actually um, shifts in microarthropod communities in the soil and uh, fungal communities and what that could mean for weeds. So again, this work has started just coming out and we'll have some of our own work, uh, hopefully knock on wood in the next year or two. Thank you. Um, and Marcy had a good question. Um, any chance, or maybe maybe people in Europe are considering this, have you considered a backpacker handheld zapper system for shrub and perennial gardens? Yeah, so there is one in Brazil. The Zasso company has one. And I am, I have a Brazilian colleague out at Oregon. Again, they are not in the US right now, um, but he's got connections. So I am, I am working it to try and get one, at least for research purposes here uh, at Cornell to sort of to facilitate that movement into the into the into the U.S., there is there is one, and I believe there's one in Europe. Again, not here right now, but I'm trying to get my hands on one. Um, oh, yeah, it ex it, it does exist. It's it's just market, right? Yeah, it's not market here. Cool, thank you. And then one one other question was: you mentioned European companies working on electrical weeding equipment. Can you name the top one or two companies in this field? Yeah, so we're looking at Zasso, Rootwave, CropZone, and Weed Zappers here in the US. I think there's probably more, but how about these are the companies I've talked to? Cool. Well, that's, um, I guess I have one more question. Are you planning to do any um, work on cover crops and suppression of um, um, herbicide resistant weeds as part of your program or is that something that maybe will other people so, will do well other so i'm going to tell you um right now university of maryland got a, a cppm grant to do basically this work that you're talking about they're actively um collaborating with state records in delaware right now um, I, have a, I, I have a potential incoming student who is very interested in seed banks and um, cover cropping and uh, improving system-wide weed suppression. So kind of what I need right now is I need a personnel to come in and, and do some of that work with me um, because right now I am doing all of the crops and so I need help. <laughs> Um, and Paul Gier from Tompkins County Soil Water is interested in upcoming demonstrations of an electrical weeding. So we'll, we'll try to keep all abreast yeah. of that and we'll send it to the list and stuff. So we are hoping for some, maybe something in Geneva, maybe basically we can have kind of like a, a Geneva field day or extension. A lot of it is gonna be Cornell restrictions due to COVID, um, but I'm hoping to get an electrical weeder here um, for demonstration, as well as a precision vision guided cultivator and uh, a precision vision guided sprayer. Oh, thank you so much, Lynn, for your time. I learned a lot from that, and I'm sure a lot of other folks did too.